Hello, good evening. I would like to introduce our short speaker, uh, Christine Roche. Christine Roche is a board certified nutrition specialist and nationally certified biofeedback therapist and has developed an integrative approach to nutrition and health counseling based on 25 years of experience in healthcare field. She developed and taught courses at Stanford University uh, Medical Center and heart disease prevention programs in 1980s and was a staff member of the Berkson Integrative Clinic in Los Altos. Christine is the author of two books. Her most recent is Light Living, an Integrated Approach to Health and Weight with audio CDs that complement each chapter of her workbook. She has maintained a private practice in health counseling since 1983 and specializes in customized nutrition counseling for digestive issues, inflammation, hypertension, adrenal and blood sugar balancing, eating disorders, uh, metabolic syndrome, emotional and stress eating. She is a patient advocate and is an important part of her practice. Uh, Christine's website, if you want to look her up and read more about her, is www.lightlivingprogram.com. Let's give a big welcome for Christine. Well, it's great to be here on the other side, and usually in the audience. And um, how I got into this field is that I was working at Stanford Medical Center and I found very much of the same things that Burton was talking about is so many people with digestive issues that were unexplained, where there were a lot of issues of what's going on, who also had at the same time anxiety, irritable bowel syndrome, ADD, ADHD, and a lot of other conditions, schizophrenia, you know, whatever, a whole list of mental disorders. And when I was at Stanford in the 80s, no one knew what to do. So they all came to us at the clinic and we were told, you know, whatever you can do. So working at the Bergson Clinic, I had some incredible experiences, which I'm going to share with you today, um, especially with patients who were, where we used this integrative approach and some of the changes we saw that were lasting changes. So I'd like to start with, um, beginning with this statement here that all disease begins in the gut, and you all know this. You all have a lot of good information already that you've been studying. So um, to go right into the brain-gut axis, how many of you have sometimes found yourself having digestive symptoms and brain fog at the same time? Is that familiar? Or you have brain fog and you know, you know, anything in the brain, such as depression or poor memory is related, right, to the, that can be related to that, or you might have both. So here are some of the clinical presentations of brain-gut disorders, which could be, you know, the fatigue, the depression, as I was already saying, IBS. I've seen a lot of people with inflammatory bowel disease, with anxiety, depression, and very serious mental symptoms that all went away once they were able to resolve the fire that was burning in the digestive system. It's incredible. So memory, you know, bloating. And so here are some of the studies. This is from 2008. For those of you that like looking at the studies, it's, you know, there's a lot of data that shows how it goes with the psychiatric disorder. And this last year, I had the privilege of working with a couple of Stanford psychiatrists who were sending me patients with really serious depression, you know, different things usually related to eating disorders, weight, and so these were some of the things, you know, they all, a lot of them had digestive issues. Similarly, a lot of them had fibromyalgia. I'm gonna go pretty quickly because of the time, and autism is very much a situation where it's always a digestive involvement, and those, you know, many of you know that autism is related to gluten intolerance and all of the other things we've talked about that. And most of the patients we saw with Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, all had an involvement with the gut. So that every single patient I saw, I worked for years with an endocrinologist, when we got them off gluten, major change in the inflammation in the digestive system, 
and changes in their markers, in their autoimmune markers, really <coughs> significant. So um, these are just some more information about what happens with people with IBS, mental disorders in adolescence. It's very prevalent. It's like an epidemic of young people that I'm seeing with eating disorders and various disorders that have a lot of inflammatory inflammation, like a fire burning in the gut. So I'm gonna be talking about what you can do about that with the clients or for yourself. So um, what happens is also in traumatic brain injury, if you know anyone with that, it, re it induces intestinal permeability, the mysterious leaky gut term, right? <laughs> that is so often something that I've been questioned over and over again, and also that um, when your neurotransmitters change and you have impl inflammatory bowel disease and all of that, you're going to have a big change in that area. So I just wanna go through the definition of permeability. How many of you know what gut leaky gut means or intestinal permeability? I've heard of it before. So most of you, that's great. <laughs> this is really good. Um, and so what I'd like to do now is to show you the difference in terms of some of the symptoms of leaky gut. Notice how many mental symptoms are there. And I'll go into some specific cases of patients I've seen, and it's been amazing in terms of how much their mood swings changed when we got the permeability, healed their permeable gut, all of a sudden they said, I'm no longer anxious. You know, my mood is more stable. I'm, they're more responsive to natural neurotransmitter support. So some of the psychiatrists I'm working with, you know, are giving people very high doses of SSRIs, but they're not, they're saying, you know, let's just give more of a dose and a higher dose instead of looking at what can we do to support the patient with the digestive system or that. So it's always something that you wanna look for. So here it is. Here's a movie of a healthy gut with the junctions intact. So notice what happens. So with a healthy junction in the small intestine, in the lining, what we're able to do is absorb the nutrients, get the nutrients in our body, and also there is a protective barrier there that's really important that most of you know about that keeps out the bacteria, the fungus, and the toxins that are generated by a leaky gut. Notice what happens here where you have the leaky gut junctions right here with the molecules. So everything is getting into the bloodstream. And so what happens is, you know, if you have a leaky gut, basically it leaks out and it looks like this. I love this slide because it shows really, I mean, people are saying, well, I can't believe that this could happen. It turns out that leaky gut a lot of times happens as a result of stress can change your permeability also toxins, environmental toxins. And there's a lot of aspects of, uh, that show that prescription drugs, even if you're only taking one prescription drug, it can change your permeability. And this is where I learned as I was working clinically with these people how dramatic the changes were that we could see, but we also noticed nobody was, everyone was denying that this was happening. So um, this is an example of that the more stress you have, the physiology of stress and permeability. And when you have more of the stress hormones and higher cortisol, the immune system gets suppressed and it gives you the flow of secretary IgA. And what happens to the gut immunology, which is the first thing they measure in Europe. I just love measuring the Sig A, you know, which is something that we don't look at here. So, um, brain mechanisms of leaky gut, so this gives you a sense of that. And what I found, because I am from Europe, I grew up in Austria, I lived in Switzerland for many years, what I noticed is that here, you know, every physician was saying just do the stool swab and, or call blood, yes or no. And there we measured secretary IgA, we measured the immunology, and that's what doctor's data does. So I have some examples in, of that also. So here's a good picture of the villi, which are so important. And if you have a compromised membrane and you've damaged the villi, you know you're not absorbing the most crucial things that you need to absorb. So your body is also not making the neurotransmitters that you need that are so crucial for mood and behavior. 
So these are some of the, the different you know, food sensitivities, which I'm going to talk about, are a key factor here, gluten, dairy. So I do food allergy testing with all of my clients at the same time that I'm doing permeability testing if needed. And I look at, I do the doctor's data stool test, which you'll see an example of that measures all of the analytes, inflammation, secretory IgA, bacteriology, mycology, really looking at the entire milieu, the environment that is so important to look at. So what happens when you eat gluten? I mean, you all know this. Everybody here is familiar with this, the opioid effect you know, in the brain, the gluten withdrawal, autoimmune. So every person that would come into the clinic, you know, if they have rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's, different autoimmune problems, it's really important to do a digestive analysis and look at what's going on. So here are some of the symptoms, uh, too numerous, you know, <laughs> to really mention. I mean, you all know, how many of you are gluten sensitive in this room? Yeah, so a large percentage. You know how that can actually cause a lot of permeability amongst many other things and cause that and then you, you need to spend time healing it. We found people spend years healing this uh, permeability that happens with the gluten sensitivity and brain inflammation. So here's the thing that everyone was really excited about is to say that there are 12 different aspects of wheat and similar grains and we know it isn't just the wheat. It's a lot of the, almost every grain has gluten in it. So, um, so I teach people at the clinic, you know, how to cook and also how to discern when they go out to eat to avoid the gluten in their diet. And, and this has made a huge difference in migraines, brain fog, and the ADD and how many of you are familiar, most of you are probably with Natasha McCampbell Bright with her work, the fire in the gut. So, you know, she's worked so much with helping the children with ADD, ADHD, autism spectrum by letting go, by really investigating the digestive axis that these kids became normal. They talked, they were able to, they were completely non-functional on a range and they become, became very functional in their lives. So this is what I loved about this information, which is that the gluten reactions are not confined to the gut only because gliadin is found systemically, the antibodies. So when you have leaky gut, which is caused by gluten, but also if you are eating it, let's say you don't have leaky gut and you have an antigen reaction, you know, there's a lot that goes on in every organ of your body and that's why it's so important to pay attention to that. So, um, so it seems that inflammatory cytokines and their signaling is very important in depression and neurotransmitter metabolism. And this is really overlooked in psychiatry completely. So I found it really fascinating. I was doing the research. I talked to so many psychiatrists that I've worked with and no one had ever even heard of this information or this research that the, you know, when you have someone with severe mental disorder, bipolar, the first thing you want to look at is where is the fire in the gut? Where is, are these cytokines that are going around the body? So it's, it's a really important part. And depression and gluten is certainly linked. This is really a key. Um, it's a, you know, very, very clearly proven. Gluten and brain fatigue. So people, um, you know, so I want to go over now some clinical case examples that have been very exciting for me. I worked with an endocrinologist and also worked with an internist um, with patients that have had either, you know, neurotransmitters, mental issues, or in this case, I have a number of people with inflammatory bowel disease as distinguished from IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. How many of you know the difference between IBS and IBD. So it's really important to know that in, in, you know, irritable bowel syndrome is very easy to correct and it has to do more with stress and stress hormones and cortisol response, whereas the inflammation is very, it's a very serious problem, inflammatory bowel disease. So um, this is a 38-year-old woman and she had ulcerative colitis, daily flare-ups, she was given prednisone by her physician, hydrocortisone, rectal enemas, and here are her readings, and she came in, and what she said to me is, 
the mother is who's a client of mine said to me we have tried everything this has been going on for a really long time and nothing has been helping and she's been given one drug her face was swollen her whole body was swelling you know she was really in a crisis when she came to see me so really her levels um, and so, ba well, this is actually the, the, the part where um, the, the most severe outbreak, she had very high stress, 14-hour days, poor diet, fast food three days a week, and diet sodas daily with constipation, right? So that was certainly a factor, but she also had, had um, no symptoms at all, even with the same, you know, having the same diet. So there was something else going on in this case. So Amy Green, what we found here, this is what I, how many of you have done the doctor's data comprehensive digestive stool test with your clients or with um, personally? I highly recommend it. Actually, I have a sign-up sheet over there if people would like to sign up and hear about it at my office. This is a functional test that assesses, like Burton said, where the body is before the disease develops. And I love it because people come in and say, my doctor's doing the the uh, fecal sample, why right? do I need anything else? Well, this does a 12-page report on every aspect of how your digestive system is functioning, and it's non-invasive. It's a three-day subsequent stool collection. So n look at her lysozyme levels. Lysozyme is an enzyme that shows the level of inflammation. This will show up, you know, it's 912, normally 600. This is gonna show up, I found, Years before, as Burton was saying, any problems, major diseases start. Lysozyme is elevated in you know, a lactoferrin. It's an indicator, a specific marker of inflammation that differentiates IBD from IBS and really monitors the inflammation. And in her case, you can see many white cells and secretary IgA is 158, which is good, which is her first line of immune defense. So I'm gonna go a little bit faster here now just to show you what I love about this test, which you can all do in the privacy of your home, you can do it yourself on your own, and you get the results back, and here it is, her bacteriology, you know, very deficient, no growth in the lacto, she's got overgrowth here in the bacteria, she's got, let's see, this one was showing again some inflammation with a few blood, red blood cells, you know, she had a lot of occult blood because she was bleeding every day. So basically what happened is, the daily food symptom diary, L-glutamine, fish oil, elimination diet, the test, and then here are the things that I put around. This lady, within two months, the bleeding stopped, she went off the drug, she went to see her doctor, and I said, don't go off anything, you know, make sure your doctor sees this, and he said, well, you don't need the cortisone, but let's keep you on this other drug. So eventually what happened is she wanted to go off of that too, and she did. So she's now a year later completely symptom-free on colonoscopy, totally healed with the inflammation. She stayed on the aloe vera, the added fiber, you know, all the vegetables. Um, she was really um, major improvements, and the flare-ups basically went, went away, you know. So when I talked to her, now she says, I'm planning a family, I can travel, I can do whatever I want to do. She was incapacitated. So this was a combination of using this great test with the combination also of really food log, look at what your reaction is to food, food allergy testing, and the right nutrients and together, you know, with the supplements. The other patient had acne, anxiety, panic disorders, and ulcerative colitis. Blood in the stool every day, again, had been trying everything. You can see she's got a, a um, dysbiotic flora, which means a good neighborhood gone bad. If you have this dysbiotic flora here, there's a very good chance that you could be getting some type of autoimmune disorder over a period of time. So this shows, you know, it's really important you test your bacteria, your bacteriology, your dysbiotic flora, and I'm going very fast because of the time here, <laughs> you're really aware. Um, what I noticed is patients who have rheumatoid arthritis, who have Autoimmune, again, there's this dysbiosis. So what we did is, she had her lactoferrin was up, she, her CIG A was, was sort of okay, but what we found is that she was very allergic to triticale, the gluten, on the uh, food allergy profile. 
So by removing alcohol, gluten, and dairy for 30 days, the bleeding stopped again. But she also said that her panic attacks and anxiety after six months are basically gone. And I'm, you know, I'm looking at the studies, and I've seen this over and over again in practice with the clinics I work with, with the physicians. So here are some of the supplements. And these, like um, the L-glutamine, the PERC and Duragard is great for people with um, specific junction disorders. And here's what, I, what we worked with. And the aloe liquid made a huge difference. I mean, this is not something, you know, she had to be committed because these are young ladies. I also have a lot of people in their 60s and 70s, but you have to be very committed to want to heal the gut. And it can take a few months, it could take years. I have one lady, it took five years to heal the permeability. Now, all her levels are normal. She says her energy's picked up and she's doing you know, so great, but it, it really takes that dedication to stay away from the foods that you don't want to eat and have this, you know, really stay with this. Here's some repair supplements, and these are great, the DGL, the glutamine, um, gamma orizonol, quercetin, you know, these are all functional nutrition supplements that you can take that will make a big difference in, in healing the um, leaky gut, but also working with getting the whole secretary IgA, because what I found when I used some of these things, the key wasn't just the leaky gut. If you have no immunity here, it's like you're a sitting duck for anything that comes along. So the neurotransmitters weren't made properly, because most of them, as you all know, are manufactured in the gut. And then the immune system, with almost everyone I see, we do the CIG-A test, and it is, guess what? It is usually 20, it should be 100, 20 or less, 90% of the clients I see. So that's why it's so important, because you don't have any symptoms, you have no immunity here, you need to do things to build your gut immunology. That's really important. So, you know, certainly probiotics. Here are some of the things you can do. You can take the um, stool sample or the saliva, and this is the, the most important immune modulating is right here. So how, what we eat every day, the grains we eat, you know, everything, customized diet, which we're all doing. But I think the most important thing is to tune into your body and really say, you know, what's happening with this? Because I found that when the sick A went up, my school teacher and all of my clients who got sick four to six times a year, guess what? The sick A went from 20 to 100. They were no longer getting sick. So people are saying, my gosh, everyone around me is dropping. I'm staying well. So what I now do with every client, once a year, my clients come in, they do the doctor's data, three-day stool test as part of their annual physical. It is the best preventive medicine that you can do, and it really shows you incredible things. Here's an example of what a sick A looks like, a marker on the doctor's data test. And here's how to improve sick A. And basically, Saccharomyces boulardii, 2.5 billion CFU is a great way to improve. If you're a consumer and you say, I just want to raise my CK, I don't know if it's low or what it is, you know, use that, use whey protein, colostrum, and your inflammatory markers. And they just had a recent study that showed that heart disease is now connected with the gut immunity. So if we have the right amount of secretary IgA, our risk for heart disease is lower. It's, it's incredible. I mean, to see that's, you know, that's one of the, the things. So uh, again, re inoculate, um, use case specific probiotics. I have people take two or three bottles and then I ch they change to other probiotics. You don't want to always use the same probiotic, and probiotic is pro life. It's the most important thing you can do. So um, again, I, I have over there. Um, my book and some information about my practice if you're interested in a digestive analysis. I do want to open it up now to questions, but you can sign up with your name, email, and phone, and I'm happy to do that. Yes? Yeah, yeah Crohn's is a very serious disease, and um, I have most of my experience is with inflammatory bowel disease. The Crohn's patients I have seen um, I, we had to work together very specifically with different protocols and so on. So be, it would be different. And it's different for each person. Yeah. Yes? Yes, I have. 
So that's a great question. I actually reviewed the GI effects because I, I went to all the functional medicine forums which were reviewing GI effects with this test and this is much better. I find that the analytes here, the way that it measures it and I again contrast it, I would say the gut immunology measurement, I feel better about this than about the, um, the other one. The GI effects does not measure some of the analytes I wanted to get. There were some differences and I'm happy to talk to you about it more what I found. Yes, uh-huh. Excellent, I have that on the slides, but the time cut off at all fermented food. So I have like sauerkraut, cultured sauerkraut, any cultured food, miso soup, tempeh is fantastic for helping you with rebuilding the flora. And I have to say what you need to do is build your secretary IGA, rebuild the flora with the cultured food, and work on some of these other intestinal healing agents that heal the permeability, if that's there, for optimal immunity. Because cancer, like Burton was talking about, is often the end result of gut compromised gut immunology is one of the key factors in that. Yeah, exactly. That just goes right through. Yes. Speak a little bit louder, please, and you should let me get the mic to the second mic. Or or okay. I, had a, I had a friend who insisted her candida went away with a product called Trilac, but when I Googled it and checked on Amazon, there were people that were apparently having problems with enterococcus, I think, fecalis that was in the Trilac. But others were saying that the Bacillus subtilis in it was supposed to be good, and you know, out in Costco, you can buy bacillus coagulans in a in a product. So I just wondered what you thought about the subtilis. Um, I have many slides on there, which I can't show, but I hope to show another time, that talk about the um, the problem that so many strains don't even make it into the digestive system. I mean, it's it's like so. I have not heard about that one that it's necessarily superior. As a matter of fact, there's so many things we read. You've got to buy this and it's this. What I use is Claire Labs and Kirkman. Those are the two where I found it's consistent. I can test with these tests and Claire Labs, it cultures out and it takes. If I do these others that I've used, all the probiotics in a whole, whole Foods 30 billion CFU, unless you have hundreds of billions and you vary them, and you test here, there is no difference. People are still a zero. They have to be a four plus on all of these that I was showing you, not just the lacto and bifida, a four plus on all of them. So unless you get varied strains and you get the right kind, and then the stomach acid is a whole other issue. You know, if, the, if they're on a drug that affects their stomach acid, or you know, if they're on pharmaceuticals, they kill off all the gut flora. So if somebody, if you have a, a patient or somebody who is, is on a pharmaceutical drug, you need to give them extra probiotics as a way of helping to heal the gut. With electric thermal screening, one would know which one is mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, you can titrate, it's perfect, because you need to know, and sometimes a person will only respond to a certain probiotic for a short time, and then you change it. So this is exactly a good solution, yes. I'm just wondering, what about pea protein? It's excellent. Um, what I find is that I pretty much like whey, though, builds the secretary IgA. So colostrum, you know, the Saccharomyces boulardii, the whey, build the gut immunology. So the rice and pea is very good for getting protein for making neurotransmitters, because you need protein at every meal to do that. But it's not necessarily building the immunology as much as the whey protein, yeah. Yes. What types of typical infections, uh, parasitic lives, bacteria Can you, can you come down a little bit if somebody bring the mic up? <laughs> uh, working with these IBS slash IBD patients, what type of um, parasitic bacterial infections are you finding? And how are you removing them? <laughs> <laughs> So um, remember what I really liked about the doctor's data is it shows bar parasitology because of the lack of time, I didn't focus on that. But I found that these people all have severe, you know, like overgrowth in all of their bacteria in the gut. And usually there's either a parasite that's there and, you know, at the Which end. Which ones though, specifically? 
Uh, like for example, IB, you know, IBD, yeah. it's mo like the Klebsiella pneumonia and all of these things. I see like three or four this biotic. That is very consistent with that. Or with somebody who has a mental problem too, there's these inflammatory um, neighbor, you know, a total neighborhood that's inflamed because it's, it's the bad bacteria. But I also found that yeast infection is very common and I know from European biological medicine there's a lot of different fungi and microbes that if they have leaky gut that are in the blood that then affect all of this together and, and really need to be addressed. So I found, you know, when I worked with the physician, we used both plant-based protocols as much as possible, but some of these people we needed to use a combination of pharmaceuticals with the plant-based to really get a result. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. How much glutamine do you have people take? Um, I usually a thousand. What I find with the IBD or the IBS, I was using like a thousand milligrams three to four times a day. Then there were some people who needed more or less than that. That's why the you know some form of screening is so critical. But I find with the with the neurotransmitter folks or the eating disorders, you know, they're trying to heal the gut. It's about three thousand a day, the average. Some people need six thousand. Some need two thousand. And, and it's really important to be aware of what type of L-glutamine. I find certain types are better than others. So if you want to know more about it, I can tell you. Because I just recently researched that, that people really like the powder versus the capsules. So the powder is easier. And I don't recommend, most of my clients are doing powders or liquids or drops. I don't think, I think too many were just over-capsulized and all that. But I have found a form of glutamine now that doesn't have the danger in certain small numbers of people that, that you know goes into this glutamic acid, which can cause a lot of hyperreactivity. So I have now found many different, uh, you know, I've gotten different resources on what type of L-glutamine. So again, it's the with each of these people, you know, I spend an average of maybe six hours customizing their plan. And then after that, they just came in once a quarter and they were just doing great. And so that's why I'm keeping all these files because it's so inspiring to see once that, that was healed, how, how far they could go in their life. So. so I have a question. Do you have, what do you use for parasites? Do you have herbal combinations? Or? I work with a physician with that, um, with the parasitology because it comes up a lot. And they're using, we try to use microbial agents as much as possible. So, you know, grapeseed extract or much stronger. I know that you know the real strong, terrible things, right, where people just say, how can I ever take that? So there are very strong herbs, and that's what we've tried to do, but we retested, and it was not. There are a couple of times where the functional doctor would say, you know, we're retesting it's not showing it's taking, so, but then we used uh, these uh, compounds, the natural microbial with the pharmaceutical at a very low dose. And that because again, the pharmaceutical will just lead to leaky gut. So you give them a dose of a drug to cure the parasite and the patient has permeability, and where are we then? Then we're back to a permeable leaky gut and the cycle continues, right? So, so I always feel that you should be using for parasites if you can zap them, you know, Halder Clark's the zapper, you hold on to something and it's all energy and it just saps, you know, through the transmission of frequency. I think you can kill a lot of parasites that way. So that's my opinion. You can do that. What L-glutamine product are you finding <laughs> does not go into the excitability? Yeah. Yes. Well, this is, this is very interesting. I mean, I've been using a lot of different brands of L-glutamine. And um, I have been using the, um, you know, a lot of times through encapsulations and others. I have had only in a very small, I don't think I've ever actually had it in 20 years of practice where that was the case. But because I have seen it in the larger picture, you know, I've been reading about it, um, that I can, I can email you what it is. I mean, I just recently was researching the type of L-glutamine that would. Just say it. Yeah. Just say it. What's the brand? Well, I use. I use basically, I mean, as I said, I've used many brands and it hasn't happened, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. In the literature, and we all said to me in the clinic, where it did happen, it wasn't even me giving them the L-glutamine. They were very excited to it, they had an allergic reaction, right? So I think that um, I can, anybody that wants to know that, put it down and I'll email it to you, because I just found the article, I have been researching this, 
And I'm happy to send you the email of the type of L-glutamine that is most likely it's not going to happen because I know that's really a concern. So. Any other questions? You can just put your email down. Dr. Holga Clark talks about parasites. And can you use ground clover to get rid of parasites? find that it doesn't work a lot of the time. This is the thing, I mean, the zapper is effective for some people or the frequency machines, but that I have not seen. And that's why black walnut or, you know, berberine and the grapeseed and some of the, you know, traditional uber earth seed. But it depends on what it is, because you have to also get rid of the dysbiotic flora. So the parasite, and then there's still the bad neighborhood. And if you have that, then you're always going to have the inflammatory cytokines in your system with that. I think that both Christine and I would say you have to use a multi-pronged attack with parasites. Clove is effective in combination with other things. In isolation, I don't find any one herb kills parasites. It, it's it's a multiple. It's a combination of. Also the timing. Yes, and they go with the moon cycles, so you have to cycle it appropriately. And every time you kill a parasite, they dump eggs. So that's why it's so difficult to get over. And once you start to kill parasites, if you don't carry through, you have way more parasites in you than you did to start with because you had all those eggs. And you talk about a uh, And it will cause terrible brain fog. You, you think that you're, you're, you, you've gotten Alzheimer's and you have parasites. So when you're creating this die-off reaction because you're, you know, uh, breaking down all this bacteria, your liver has to process endotoxin and all these other, you know, guys, um, what, what do you recommend to help bind that up and to um, help lessen the Herxheimer? Some kind of soluble fiber, charcoal? One of the things that we did in our clinic was minerals, working with different minerals in addition to the fiber you know, buffering it. I think the key, what I have found, is that I'm very careful in my practice to not do things that would cause an acute Herxheimer's reaction. And I've worked, you know, I try to really do a thorough investigation, especially with this, with the functional model or the testing. Um, so it, it has happened, but it's happened a lot less in my practice. I find that the really acute cases, you know, the physicians, because I do work as part of a team, uh, usually we're working with, you know, with oxygen, with everything they can, but minerals and minerals, um, ionic minerals was one of the things that we're using, as well as shifting, you know, really seeing that it was too acute because it was done too fast. That's what happens a lot. And so I really believe to go very slow, like with these IBD patients, I didn't just, you know, give it to them really fast. They would have gone overboard, but just to go very slowly and to test with electrodermal screening, with other tests to make sure that the patient can do it gradually. I mean, these were all people that had no detox. Most of the people haven't had it, but severe patients would definitely have that. So it's a really good question. Is there a mineral product specifically, one you're alluding to here? What's the product? Um, you can come up and I'll send it to you. Just put it on the email. Yeah, there's so many different ionic minerals and you know, thing. And again, what I do is customize everything to the patient, and I always work with them very individually to, in terms of what's needed. Yeah. So. I would second what Christine said, though. You buffer it with uh, the Herx is basically causing massive acidity in the body. You add the minerals, and it helps to alkalize the body back. But that's just one of the things that you need to do. Um, but it helps tremendously. Any other questions? We're going to call it a night then. Thank you very much, Christine. <laughs>